Well, there's, it's, I think, yeah, well, I think that has to do with the lack of media coverage about, <laughs> um, about her specifically, right? Um, uh, I mean, she's not the only one. Um, no, not at all. No, but it's, uh, yeah, it is, it is quite astounding. Um, so in the interest of sort of, um, you know, um, mitigating some of the, um, efforts by some perhaps of, uh, uh, saying, you know, Bill Gates is in charge of all of this and he's the one to be looking at. Uh, what role would you put someone like Bill Gates and some of these other, uh, billionaire philanthropists and, in, in sort of your, your model? Where does someone like Bill Gates fit in in the, in the GPPP? Um, I think, I mean, I would say, my, I, I, well, the honest answer is I don't know. But I mean, I would say policy distributors. But I think, you know, in terms of certainly people like Schwab and Gates have been the faces of two different aspects of what I've called the pseudo pandemic. So Gates has very much been the kind of, or he was in 2020 since his, you know, since his divorce, um, and I and I don't know whether that will have any bearing on your forthcoming book. Um, he seems to have gone rather quiet. But I've, I've noticed that he's been creeping back into the limelight recently. But I mean, for one thing, I mean, he has had a series of meetings with the British Prime Minister. I think he had three in 2020. They've just sort of welcomed him for another one recently. Um, so I would say policy distributor, somebody who is who is uh, meeting and greeting political leaders uh, and is part of the net of, of the distribution of of policy agendas um and, and and i would argue the same probably for you know someone like klaus schwab who who um you know i mean has been has been presenting the kind of econ- the, you know been the sort of face of the economic reform and as i must say that is a very strange choice for someone to present um you know the case for global um, economic reform, but um, yeah, you know, he's he's quite Bond yeah. villainy, so it is kind yeah, of he, odd he, <laughs> that he would be odd, chosen. Odd kind of, but I mean, I suppose you know he he has been involved in, um, you know, I mean, writing some. I mean, and this is something else that you don't really know. I mean, to what degree? And when we talk about the book, the Great Re- Reset, to what degree did Thierry Mason? have in you know right in that you're right mm-hmm. he, yeah i mean schwab takes the credit <laughs> but um you know did he, he, he are these even his ideas i mean i think it, there's some case to be made in schwab's case that they are well stakeholder because, I mean, stakeholder it, capitalism and and, and ha- selling what that system actually is a stakeholder capitalism probably a better way to, to put it uh, as you mentioned uh, earlier on you know he's been doing that since the 70s so I think that's part of why he's sort of um the face of this because he wants to be he sees it sort of as something that his life's work uh you could argue um and uh that that's probably why despite you know maybe there's obviously someone who could be a better uh <laughs> choice in terms of optics but I think maybe um he he uh, Schwab may sort of just be the first face for it because we have things like the um Council for Inclusive Capitalism um, as it's called, and that is actually headed by the Pope, um, which is, which is interesting. So it's very possible that, you know, maybe, uh, Schwab is the face of that, uh, or has been recently, uh, but, you know, the Pope could, um, <laughs> uh, come out and, and issue a call for that. I think he actually has relatively recently, but it could, you know, um, uh, increase in, in terms of its, uh, uh, media attention and, and what have you. It's worth noting, by the way, that that Council on Inclusive Capitalism, um, pretty much the same people that are members of that are also on the World Economic Forum Board of Trustees. Um, uh, in, with the addition of, you know, some people like Lynn Forrester, De Rothschild, um, the Lauder yeah. family, uh, who are sort of part of that mega group, uh, power faction, uh, of, of Epstein related fame, if you're familiar with my work on the case anyway. Um, but, you know, just uh, so several factions of the global elite are, are very willing to back this particular thing. So maybe Schwab is is the face for now and wants to be sort of the be seen as the progenitor of the movement publicly, even though a lot of people in, in, in these networks know that he is right. I think he sort of wants that <laughs> that role for himself before maybe more 
uh, other faces maybe take the uh, take some of the limelight in that sense. Yeah, I mean, well, you'd, uh, yeah, I mean, it, what's it? Oh, I forgot his name. Is it Larry Fink, head of um, BlackRock? Yes. Uh huh. I mean, he's he's very willing to speak out. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, he loves to. He goes on CNBC <laughs> almost like every day. It seems like saying uh something else yeah mm-hmm. he's also on the world economic forum board of trustees and um yeah, exactly. if you're familiar with the work of uh john titus and, and Catherine austin fitz was very involved in the whole um uh, setting federal reserve policy so blackrock i think in this hierarchy um that you established has an interesting uh role um particularly in the sort of the policy maker sphere uh, because they exert influence on central banks or the world's largest investors. So they exert a lot of influence over just tons and tons of corporations, um, depending on the size of their stake um, in those particular corporations. And then, of course, you know, he's on the uh, Fink is on the, the board of the World Economic Forum and probably some of these other um, global think tanks as well. So that's sort of an, a very interesting uh, organization to look at. And of course, Black Ar- BlackRock is, are, you know, the most powerful in that category, arguably, but you also have like Vanguard and some of these other yeah, major know. investors as well that do that. And I think, um, <clears throat> I think I mentioned this on my last podcast, but I'm not entirely sure, but the whole ESG investing, uh, I don't know how much you yeah. looked into that, Ian, but it's, um, I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I no, think BlackRock I mean, will be, I- oh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, one of the I, I've looked at that quite a bit in the book. Um, the, I mean, I've spoken about how, and, and in your um, recent article, um, Wall Street's takeover, uh, takeover of nature, um, I've spoke very much about what I've called the theft of the global commons, because the global commons is, I mean, what that you were talking about, it is the the resources that all it is actually defined as the resources that all life depends upon. Um, and that definition came from, um, I think, the UN in a in a. Um, it was a, a September 2011 issue of, a, of a, a magazine called Our Planet. I don't know whether you've ever read it written by the by the UN. Um, and they defined the global commons as, quote, the shared resources that no one owns, but all life relies upon. And that's been, and, and shorthand, that has been, you know, called the commons or, and these were, this is one of the things that well, I think is also important, that's something else I try to, try to address in the book, is these words get bandied around and people say things like, yeah, well, we're, you know, we're talking about stewardship of the global commons and that kind of goes over people's heads. Because they they rarely kind of look at what that means, right? And that these these words have very very specific meanings. Now the World Economic Forum have said that they want to be trustees of the global commons. <laughs> yeah, well, obviously, well, well, obviously, trustee has got a very specific legal meaning. It does. So basically, what are the global the, the global commons? have become have been expanded over the years i think it was um it was the secretary general um antonio um, gutierrez he gave a speech in december of last year where he expanded upon the global commons um and he said that um it was um it was, uh, to put it simply, quote, this is a quote, to put it to put it simply, the state of the planet is broken. Human activities are at the root of our descent towards chaos. So, again, it's the idea of humanity being the, the, the cause of everything. Uh, the recovery from the pandemic is an opportunity. It is time to flick the green switch. We have a chance to not simply reset the world economy, but to transform it. We must turn this momentum into a movement. Everything is interlinked. The global commons and global well-being. This means more and bigger effectively managed conservation areas, biodiversity positive agriculture and fisheries. More and more people are understanding the need for their own daily choices 
to reduce their carbon footprints and respect planetary boundaries, from protests in the streets to advocacy online, from classroom education to community engagement, from voting booths to places of work, we cannot go back to the old normal. We have a blueprint. The 2030 Agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Now is the time to transfer, transform humankind's relationship with the natural world and with each other, end quote. So they, they are talking, when they, when they talk about the global commons and something that you, you very much touched on in your article, they mean everything. They mean they mean everything. They intend to have control over all resources, all all kind of land, the oceans. I mean, initially the global commons was de de was defined as um, the oceans, uh, Antarctica, um, or oh, the atmosphere, so the air we breathe, and space, so the universe. But they've been constantly <laughs> adding to it. Adding well, to the ownership of the universe, I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now that so now they're getting now they're getting more specific. So now it's land. It's all land. It's all um, water courses. It's the food that we grow. It's everything. It's the they air, also the, air. the ecosystem the air that processes that make uh you know allow life to exist, which includes the process by which carbon dioxide is turned into oxygen by tree leaves. Um, you know, those are the types of natural assets and the article of mine that you're referring to. Um, yeah. these people are seeking to monetize. And I like how in, in your book, you, you note that, you know, the sustainable development goals are essentially to create new markets. Um, this natural asset corporation is about creating a whole new asset class that per their estimates is significantly larger than existing assets. So it allows essentially, um, the the Wall Street system uh, to have feeding frenzies for decades to come while, you know, uh, essentially distributing among themselves the control of these uh, global commons, um, you know, in, in their hands. Um, why everyone else, you know, in this, this is fundamentally a neo-feudal model. The people on yeah. the bottom, you know, have sort of this social credit, sustainable development credit, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, carbon credits. Um, you know, that, that dictate what they can and cannot do. Um, why these people, you know, will just, <laughs> uh, I don't know, just have the, the longest grift spree imaginable, perhaps, <laughs> um, uh, with, with this stuff, but it's being sold as the green movement. And it's just astounding because this is really a banker driven, uh, movement, <laughs> if anything else. And I think there's nothing more indicative of that than the fact that the, the head of green finance, at the UN is Mark Carney, the former uh, head of the Bank of England and also Bank of Canada, a central banker, central banker, um, you know, and for, uh, former Goldman Sachs as well. I mean, uh, I think that's very, um, uh, uh, very much a validation of, of your uh, hierarchy here where you're putting uh, central, a lot of the central bankers at the, at the, at the top of this <laughs> hierarchy, because really it's, um, you know, these are the guys that are driving a lot of this. Yeah. So Carney, Carney spoke at the Jackson Hole Symposium in 2019, where they came up, where BlackRock presented the idea of this, of going direct, which means basically central banks putting money into, um, you know, the, the, the feeding money directly into, into, into the economy instead of, instead of central banks being the central banks for other other banks because at the moment the model works at the moment where commercial banks they they use base money to settle their accounts but the money that we use every day isn't you know is not is not base money it's broad money but but that system is changing that's what going direct means so going direct means that central banks will control fiscal policy so if central, if central banks control fiscal policy, I mean, what does governments do? They raise taxes, they spend money, they start wars. I mean, other than that, bank, government doesn't do much else. So what they're suggesting with going direct is that central banks have control, direct control of government fiscal policy. 
And that is a coup d'etat, a global coup d'etat. That is a fundamental change in 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 the way that the, that we and the, 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 I think the important thing is it's 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 happening. It is happening. That going direct is absolutely in play at the moment. But we're still labouring under all these illusions that you know that the governments that we elect are still in charge. And as then that that is as long as that continues, that they're going to carry on rolling out this agenda because we fundamentally misunderstand how power structure how the power structure works yeah so until until we get our heads around that we're lost yeah i don't i definitely agree with that which is why um i have been very vocal about the fact that i don't vote and that i don't think that any anyone that thinks that the current mess we are in is going to be resolved at the ballot box at this stage um I think are sorely mistaken because essentially you're just, um, you know, selecting your enforcers, not the people actually driving this. Right. Um, and I think yeah. that's, uh, why, um, this discussion of, of this, this hierarchy you've sort of laid out is, um, is so important. Um, but I think what's, what's, uh, also demonstrated, uh, by this conversation in terms of how do we stop this is the fact that so much of this has, so much of their power has to do with, money and financial control. And so, you know, uh, and and obviously the CBDCs, um, central bank digital currencies, the subject of my, of my last podcast, you know, obviously that, um, is a, is a, is a step in, uh, is demonstrative of that, that they're trying to recreate, uh, the economic system to exert even more control. And, and, and it's really a cornerstone, um, of everything else. But, you know, I think it just underlies the necessity of, of beginning to develop and participate in, uh, parallel financial systems is really the, the best way to challenge this. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on that? And do you see any other sort of, uh, solutions here, uh, for how we may, uh, perhaps one day, <laughs> if the public can get their, their shit together, um, uh, confront the global public private partnership? Yeah, and I and I don't think it's um it is that complicated actually because um you know the whole purpose of of nearly everything they do and I think when we've, we've got a window of opportunity the whole purpose of everything they do at the moment is to control us so controlling us is like like um somebody might control a herd of cattle is 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 very important to them. And they, I mean, when they're trying, they're trying to manipulate us in not only into accepting the policies that they foist upon us, but into believing in them. Hence, all the propaganda and all the disinformation and all the and all the attempts to coerce us and cajole us and push us and you know into into where they want us to be. So obviously, the whole purpose of their of in order for their their scam to continue we need to comply with it we need to we need to go along with it otherwise it won't work for them so it's very simple really in many respects is that we just need not to comply with it but in order for that to work it needs to be on a mass scale because if 80 percent of us comply with it then the other 20 percent you know they i don't think they're too concerned about that and I think, you know, going back to where we started this conversation, that's that might be where we're at at the moment. Um, you know, that they're 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 at the point at the moment. Certainly, with things like uh, we've just seen uh, the health secretary recently in the UK, Sajid Javid, openly say that they're 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 going to sack people, uh, doctors and nurses who don't take the vaccine. Now, that is pretty draconian thing for a politician in the UK to say. The NHS is a is a it's almost like a religion in the UK, and for them to just openly declare that seems to suggest to me that they're not too concerned anymore about public opinion. So, and that's worrying because I think when we get to the point where they're not concerned about us, then they, that means that the agenda is ready to move forward, um, and the outlook is bleak. If we look, if we look at things like um, sustainable development, for example, every single aspect of that policy, if we look at how that's been applied in the UK, we're talking about net zero policy. It is difficult to imagine how we would be able to generate the energy that we need 
we would be able to sustain, you know, using using so-called sustainable um, energy, that we would be able to run the run the uh, the industry and run um, our society the way it is structured at the moment, without there being a lot less of us, a lot fewer. Sorry, a lot fewer of us. I mean, it, you, you look at things like like getting rid of all vehicles and having electric vehicles by by twenty fifty. Well, there isn't enough. There aren't enough raw materials on the face of the planet, even to build, even to equal the current um, uh, uh, vehicle uh, use that we have. Even if it it, it 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 means that either very very few of us will have access to independent transport. Very few, because you know there isn't enough cobalt. There isn't enough lithium. There isn't enough of these natural resources on our planet to replace the vehicles that we use. Well, so it, they plan to move away from the private car ownership model. I wrote yeah. about this um, last year. I mean, they, they came up with this in 2019. Um, well, th this was in the U.S. This was uh, the U.S. military intelligence community in Silicon Valley, the National Security Commission on uh, Artificial Intelligence. Uh, basically laying out this model, and I'm sure it's the same one the, the UK plans to follow, um, as well as essentially a, a system of electric vehicle uh, driverless Ubers. Um, and, you know, if you have enough uh, funds from your universal basic income or credits or what have you, then you will be allowed to uh, partake in, in that specific transportation system. But the uh, I think they fully plan to have the uh, era of private car ownership be a, a thing of the past and have it be this ride sharing uh, thing. Part of the, uh, you know, the, the World Economic Forums, you'll own nothing and be happy type thing, where you're also, yeah. you know, no, no longer a homeowner or a landowner, you're renting everything. You know, the uh, sort of a, a, the gutting in its entirety of the concept of of, I guess, private ownership, really, of, of anything, while these guys at the same time are taking private ownership of things like the air you breathe and the water. Um, that's yeah, the river. quite astounding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean that go, um, you, that's an interesting point that you bring up there, because what are we talking about if we don't have access to private transport? One of our one of our inalienable rights, and I'll make a distinction between inalienable rights and human rights, is the freedom to roam. That is a that is a fundamental hum, uh, fundamental inalienable right for human beings on this planet. The freedom to roam, and we've been very fortunate in sort of recent history that we've been able to roam quite far because we've had access to our own personal transport, our own private transport. If that goes. <laughs> And you are reliant upon a third party providing you that service, then the question has to be who controls that service? Because it's not you anymore. Your inalienable right to roam has just been significantly restricted. And I think that's how the how we should approach the solution to this. We need to focus on our inalienable rights and our freedoms, and we need to exercise them. Because the solution, the, the the whole point of what they are trying to introduce, the Great Reset, Build Back Better, whatever you want to call it, the whole point is centralised authority. It is centralised authority over everything. So the solution to that is decentralised freedom. That is the solution. So we have to construct something, a way of life, a way of living, a way of interacting with each other, that is based upon decentralized freedom, not centralized authority. And we need to reject that centralized authority. And that means non-compliance. But non-compliance doesn't necessarily mean, uh, don't get me wrong, I am all in favor of protesting and I'm all in favor of legal challenges and I'm all in favor of, of all that we need to throw everything we can at this um, and any means, you know, peaceful means, any peaceable means that we can throw at this to challenge what is happening are uh, all well and good. But at the end of the day, when we think about how we are going to live a more decentralised life of freedom in the face of what is a global tyranny, we can do that just by focusing on the things that we do every day. So just by focusing on the choices that we make on a daily basis. 
So for one thing, you spoke earlier about not voting. I mean, I agree with you. I would never vote. I mean, I, you know, personally, I think that voting is morally repugnant. But that's another kind of, I, you know, I digress a bit there. But the point is, there's no point voting. Because what what are you doing? You're all you're doing is legitimizing the system that is and putting your energy in a a, a dead end, <laughs> yeah. basically. Yeah, you're you're, mm-hmm. you're just you're just yeah, like you're, they're like they're like a succubus that are taking all the energy out of you, and you're pursuing what you're pursuing a change, a change. It's not going to change. A because, cosmetic change, maybe that's about yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the people you elect are not setting policy, so. It doesn't really matter who you elect because they're not in charge. So, you know, there's that. But I mean, there's other things like we we regularly just buy our propaganda. We just go out every day and buy our propaganda. And that's how that's how it gets into our living rooms. That's how it gets into our into our hands and onto our devices. We just we just go along with it. We click on the links. We in the UK, we have to pay a TV license. We did that. <laughs> yeah, that was a shock for me having to to obligation to pay for the BBC even if you refuse to watch it. <laughs> exactly. That was silly. Yeah. Okay. But, but it's those little things. If we if imagine if like twenty, thirty percent of the British population just stopped paying their T V license. Just said, No, we're not paying it. What are they what can they do? You know, that that would send that in that way we can resist this that is coming far more effectively than we can by through certainly through political means i mean the idea that i mean even if there was a a political party that came along that that promised to stand up for our inalienable rights and was going to restore the restore the freedoms that have all that have been taken from us during this pseudo pandemic even if there was a political party that, that that had a chance of being elected, which is extremely remote, this simply wouldn't be allowed to happen. I mean, the, the, there would be so much. When we we had a similar situation not long ago in the UK with uh, uh, a, the former leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, who, you know, I mean, whether you believe in politics or not, he did seem to be a genuine kind of. Um, you know, sort of democratic socialist alternative. He was dismantled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was, he was just politically assassinated from both sides, not just from his, from their, from his, the conservative Tory side, but from his own side, because there is an, a, there's an a establishment clique. In, in Parliament, and when we talk about, you know, who, who understands this agenda and who doesn't, I think there are some people in, in Parliament, as you, and we were talking about this earlier prior to the, prior to the podcast, there are some people who do, who do understand what's going on and, and, you know, and have got a reasonable idea of what the agenda is. But I think the vast majority, the rank and file of, of, of politicians in, in Parliament in the UK, certainly, they don't really I think they they still believe in, you know, the party political kind of to and fro, as if they think they are going to make a change. But when they get into power, they never do. Never. There there has not been a political party elected, arguably since 1947, that has ever done any kind of significant change in the UK. It's just a continuation of the same policy trajectory. And it, you see the same in the US. I mean, how many how many policies which the you know the Democrats absolutely lambasted of of Trump for Trump's policies have just continued. <laughs> yeah, it's always like that though. But yeah, I mean, people that are still willing to vote for Biden, I don't even know how to talk to those people <laughs> anymore at this point. You know, uh, just because if you didn't see it with Obama and you didn't see it with Trump, uh, yeah. He, probably won't ever see it even if um the current u.s president um you know can't even make a coherent sentence half the time it's uh crazy times <laughs> uh to, to believe in the 
in, in the illusion of democracy, at least in the U.S., I mean, uh, you really have to engage in some really impressive mental gymnastics to think that uh, Biden is uh, the leader of the free world at this point. Um, you know, well, I assume there's people that still believe that, <laughs> um, you know, and it's just, um, wow, how do you do that? <laughs> I mean, there was a, there was a farcical thing um, that went on at the uh, last year in in twenty twenty, or was it beginning of this year? I can't remember. But there was the G seven summit was in Cornwall in, in in the UK. Yeah. And so what came out of that was so so if we go back to this Jackson Hole meeting that happened in August of twenty nineteen, they basically agreed at Jackson Hole that they that this was the G seven bankers. They agreed that um, they would just continue quantitative easing. They would just keep printing money for for fun. They would just 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 hugely, massively increase the money supply. They would just keep pumping it, pumping it into the uh, what was a completely failed international financial and monetary system, which they admitted at Jackson Hole. They said they basically called it a busted flush. They admitted it was over. It was broken beyond repair. And so <sighs> been a good run, so, guys. Yeah, it's been a good. It's been a, we've had a good laugh. <laughs> we've enjoyed it, guys. But it's finished. You know, let's. We need a new one. It was basically what they said at Jackson Hole. Move on a few months, and the the G seven leaders meet at the G seven conference in Cornwall. Um, and the, the media report that um, Joe Biden has decided to not, well, I think I can't remember how they said it, not rein in, not rein in the financial um, spending. You know, they've decided to carry on with the quantitative easing. That is Joe Biden's plan. They, you know, I mean, you couldn't make it up. I mean, it's ridiculous. Joe Biden, obviously, it's not his plan. <laughs> 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 it's not, I mean, it's, it's, you know, whether he can, as you said, string a sentence together. He certainly hasn't got been sat anywhere with his policy advisors deciding that the 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 world needs to continue with quantitative easing. I mean, they, they've since been forced to admit, like John John Kerry, uh, who's an, an you know a, a, I think a UN envoy, I guess he is for climate change and maybe some other stuff uh, for the Biden administration, was forced to admit that Biden was like kept in the dark about like major <laughs> policy issues. That that whole um, kerfuffle with uh, France and the whole uh, Australia UK US uh, shift in, uh, in in policy there that uh, angered France. Apparently, Biden had no idea about any of that uh, per John yeah. Kerry's own admission. So people that are still, you know, being like, "Yeah, well, it's it's Biden doing all of this." I mean, well, okay. Well, I if a, if a discussion, you know, requires that you stay awake for more than 20 minutes, <laughs> you know, that might be, uh, might be tricky. Well, he couldn't him. even do know. that with uh, uh, Naftali Bennett, the new prime minister of Israel, his first visit to the U.S. So Biden obviously fell asleep in the middle of that. <laughs> no, I, I remember, I remember the media saying, it is not true. <laughs> it is not true. He didn't fall asleep. Although quite obviously he did. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, they have a much harder job, arguably, this time than they did with Trump, where it was everything he does is bad. Now they have to justify all of the insane things that come out of the Biden administration as being something other than what it very clearly is. It's, um, well, you know, at least, at least they're keeping themselves busy in mainstream media. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but and I, and I mean, I think when you were talking about what can we do about this, and you, I mean, we, he, it's an easy thing to say not vote as in as in you know you I'm I'm opposed to the idea of voting but it's not engaging in that charade as you said it's, yeah. it's not it's not engaging not spending a moment imagining that this has any real meaning it's just a, it's just a uh, it's bread and circuses it's just offered to us to keep us interested and again, I would say, you know, to keep us believing, because what we think, what we think matters to them at the moment. For now, and that is something we really have to capitalize <laughs> uh, on why we can. And, um, you know, in the UK right now, there's this push to um, 
uh, eliminate un, um, online anonymity uh, and basically um, the ability of of one to post what they want on social media. So the uh, online censorship hammer is definitely going to get um, much bigger as uh, the months advance. We'll see how long that window will be, but it's really, um, I think, incumbent on on all of us, whether you're, um, you know, uh, a, a content uh, consumer as opposed to a content creator. I mean, it really doesn't matter. Um, it, this is a very critical window for educating the public. And, you know, even if that just means your circle of family and friends and what have you, um, about where the, the power, you know, what the agenda is, who's executing it. Um, and some of the stuff we've been, we've been, we've been talking about today among, among other important topics, because really, um, that window is starting to close. And in terms of who came up with this policy for, you know, what's, what's, what was called under the Obama administration, the driver's license for the internet. You know, this isn't mm. something exclusive to the new, uh, push in the UK, uh, David's law, as it's being called. Um, it, it's something that the Obama administration tried and failed to implement. Um, Australia, the EU previously tried and failed to implement it. Um, and now it's making a comeback because they think they can make it stick this time. Um, so, you know, things like, uh, that need to be resisted, uh, hugely. I mean, just stop using social media, let them destroy social media and their attempts to control it. Um, and the same thing with CBDCs. I mean, that should be a red line that no one, uh, should allow themselves, uh, to uh, cross anyone listening to this podcast that willingly engages in the CBDC uh, system, having <laughs> having listened to everything we've talked about today, and also you know some of uh, uh, my previous episodes, uh, that that is something you should. If you're not going to draw the line at at other things like vaccine passports and whatever, draw it there, uh, because once uh, you are willing to partake in in the system to that extent, your ability to get extricate yourself from that system at a later date, if you so choose, uh, will likely be impossible. So, you know, before it gets yeah, to that point, we need to build something else. Yeah, and absolutely. And we're talking about the thing when we were talking earlier about the little things that we can do every day with the kind of simple things that we can do to resist this. Use cash and refuse not to use cash. If you go, if you go into a business and they say they won't take cash, then don't use that business. Uh, it, we have to stand on our principles if we're gonna, if we're gonna, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, and of course you can't always do that. I mean, there were there will be times where you know you have to buy something online, or or you need to buy something online, or or whatever. You know, of course we can't all be these perfect paragons of virtue all the time. But on print, you know, broadly speaking, we can do really simple things like that. Just use cash. And if they won't accept cash, then go somewhere else that does. Because that's if we do that in sufficient numbers, what you think businesses are gonna are gonna let cash die if if you know significant part of their business is paid in cash? Yeah, that's a good point. And I think that's the the uh, impulse behind Cash Friday, as a uh, Catherine Austin yeah. Fitz calls it. Yeah. Um, I know other people yeah. have promoted that. Um, as well, but really, yeah, uh, the alternative system we have to the digital one, um, needs to be used and used regularly. Conveniently, uh, where I'm, you know, uh, uh, where I am at in, in Chile, it's very easy to use, <laughs> to use cash. And I have no idea how they're going to phase that out here. Uh, it's going to be really hard, but they've gotten the Chilean populace to do a lot of crazy, uh, crazy stuff in the, <laughs> in the past year and a half. So who knows? Um, but, you know, it, it definitely depends on people using it regularly. And if a lot of the glue, most of the glue holding the system together for these guys is financial control, um, you know, we need to, I, I mean, what, what you just laid out is a very, I mean, it's essentially a passive way of, of, of resisting that's uh, much more effective than something like voting. Yeah. Um, or you could argue even uh, protesting in the streets to a significant degree because uh, those protests, they don't get media coverage anymore, um, you know, or at least mainstream media. It's not really reaching people who are not going to be within the visible uh, range of that protest. Right. So there may be a lot of people who, um, you know, you're trying to reach that may never know it even happened or how many people were there or anything like that. Right. So, you know, this is something that can be done on an individual level that's 
really quite simple, and I would argue, um, as, as you did, uh, quite effective. Um, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add um, in terms of solutions? Well, well, I think certainly we need to be supportive of each other. I mean, there, there is, there is a, uh, um, how can we describe it? I mean, it, it is a form of apartheid is, 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 is what's rapidly approaching us. So people that are not vaccinated are going to be treated as an underclass. And so we're going to have to support each other because that's the reality. I mean, they, they, the, all the things that you imagine that you think are unspeakable or unimaginable, you need to start thinking that they're not, because um, that's the way we're heading. So we that are not going to comply do need to form networks with each other, and we do need to support each other, and we do need to trade with each other, and we need to, you know, exchange goods and services with each other. I mean, one of the things that that it, it depends how this unfolds, but a, you know, if they start making access to you know business difficult for people that are unvaccinated, then we are going to have to engage in counter economics, that, that you know, and we're going to have to be able to trade on you know, quote unquote, the black market. Well, the, these are things that we not out of choice but out of necessity because it is it is that bad if they if they're willing to sack nhs doctors which looks like a distinct possibility if they are willing to sack nhs doctors who do not comply then obviously this is no longer about any kind of health concern because why on earth would you sack a doctor from what is undoubtedly an overstretched health service for no reason other than the fact that they do not comply with the government? So it's not that there's a health. There, there isn't even a health argument to be made. The, the British Prime Minister said yesterday or the day before that the vaccines do not stop the spread of the virus and do not stop you getting infected with the virus. So there is no health or medical justification whatsoever for vaccine mandates or for um, uh, vaccine passports, because all that they are, if, if you accept that they work the way that they claim that they work, then all that they are is something that reduces the likelihood of you becoming unwell with COVID-19, which means it's a personal choice about your personal risk. You're not taking a vaccine to protect anybody else because they they don't stop transmission of the so-called virus. So it, it's, a, it's a nonsense argument. So if they're, and, doc, and what, and you think doctors don't know that? Of course, doctors know that. So if you're going to, if the government are going to sack doctors, then what they are saying is, we are sacking you not because there's any reason or not because there's any any health argument or medical argument that we can make. We're going to sack you because you will not comply with the state. And that is, you know, it is where we're heading. It, it, and where we and that's, I would argue, partly what this whole thing has been about. It has been to cajole, cajole people into a mindset where they are absolutely convinced that the only way that they can live is total subservience to the diktat of the state. And that's what, uh, you know, Frostler, Giorgio Gambon and people like that spoke about when he spoke about the biosecurity state. You will jump through hoops. You will behave like a performing monkey in order to comply with the orders of the state. And that is a fundamental change of any kind of idea that we have about democracy or democratic accountability or anything like that <laughs> it's not even in the same uh like planet <laughs> as as, oh. as democracy or i mean it's an entirely different system uh anyone yeah. that that thinks you know it, getting to that stage of jumping through hoops to obey any edict uh that's claimed to be scientific when it's actually not and all of that's i mean so much of that is happening right now and it's um it's uh very stunning to see the the degree of compliance in Chile specifically. I mean, it's it's, it's uh 
a lot of people are, uh, you know, in ter- Chile is one of the more compliant countries uh, in, in this regard. Uh, and that's saying <laughs> quite a lot. Um, you could, um, I don't know. Uh, I guess you could argue maybe it has to do with, uh, maybe the consequences of the Pinochet era to a significant degree and what's happened since. Um, but it's, uh, it's quite, it's quite astounding how willing people are, um, how far people are willing to go with this whole carrot and stick thing of, oh, you can have your privileges back if you do this, that, and this, um, and not realizing that, you know, the, uh, the steps, the things you have to do in order to allegedly re- re- regain and maintain your privileges is going to be ever expanding and ever, ever changing. Um, as the technocrats seem fit, uh, uh, Chile- Chileans in general are totally oblivious to that. And I think that's probably true, um, in other countries as well, um, to a significant degree. Um, I think one of the reasons too, it's so bad here is there's no, there's no independent media at all. Um, a lot of that is exclusive to English speaking countries, uh, more often than not. Um, uh, from what I've seen anyway, not a lot of, um, movement in, in Spanish language, um, media outlets. I mean, they're <laughs> here. Everyone watches TV and it's either state TV, uh, the BBC equivalent for Chile, or it's, um, you know, um, a couple of corporate owned channels or CNN Chile. That's pretty much all there, uh, where people are getting their media here. So you can, uh, assume <laughs> how that's gone, uh, not well. So, um, but that is an advantage, uh, people in the English speaking world, uh, certainly have. Not for long. <laughs> <laughs> no, not for long. But why we do have it, um, I would like to, um, encourage people to support, uh, your work, Ian, and, uh, uh, look at purchasing your your new book. So if you could tell people how they can find your uh, uh, written work, including the article that we we focused on today, um, as well as uh, your book all, and, and your other books as well, um, and how they can support your work, um, if you could let uh, listeners know that. Uh, yeah, it's uh, in this together dot com with uh, hyphens between the words. So it's in hyphen this hyphen dot uh, together dot com. Um, and yeah, the book is freely available for download on my, on my um, website. If you uh, just uh, drop me your email and subscribe, then uh, you, the book is free. Um, uh, but obviously, that's the electronic copy. If people want to get hold of a um, physical copy, then it is available also from my website, so they can do that as well. Uh, and all my all my work um, is on my website. Um, so, yeah, so it's uh, in this together. But uh, when somebody else, uh, you know, I also write for uh, the UK column, which is ukcolumn.org. Um, uh, UK column is all one word. Um, yeah, and they've been absolutely solid throughout all of this. I mean, they've been putting out some really fantastic content. So, um, so yeah, g- please give UK column a, a, a check out. And obviously, um, you know, I need to thank the Off Guardian as well for sharing my work because, you know, it was, it's very difficult um, to get your work noticed without working collaborative, collaboratively it's with very other true. people. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, I, and that is something that actually I would say, actually, Whitney, that we really need to get our heads around in the in the alternative media. Because, you know, you know the, 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 what do the mainstream media do? They're constantly referencing each other. They've got, a, they've got, a, they're building a link wheel, basically. You know, so they're, yeah. they're, they're, they are, they're doing it. And I think, I think it's, it is a, one of a little gripe of mine, the way that, you know, there are a lot of, a few little conflicts in the alternative media kind of, you know, scene, I suppose. And, yeah. it, and, it's, and it, and it's unfortunate because I think we really need to forget about those at the moment and put them to one side and work together. I mean, obviously there's a lot of infiltration as well, which doesn't help. <laughs> no, not, not. <laughs> Not at all, but th- yeah, I think, I think there is, uh, among some, um, certainly the, the UK outlets that, that you, uh, named, uh, tend to be more collaborative than, uh, some of their US counterparts, that's for sure. Um, but it, it definitely is a problem that I hope, um, will be amelior- ameliorated at some point. Unfortunately, um, and I don't know if this is necessarily more common among US independent media than UK independent media, um, but there does seem to be a, a tendency among some uh, to place uh, brand and brand security over 
um, what they will report on and, and if they report on a particular topic, if they will cite, uh, people's work, um, who sort of, uh, laid the foundation for, for that. You know, there's been, uh, some issues. <laughs> Uh, I, I obviously don't yeah. want to go into specifics about no, it, no, no, but no, no, I, I no, think no, no, definitely, no. Um, you know, in, in alternative uh, media, there there definitely does need to be a shift for, for some. Um, I think there are some sort of uh, behind the scenes networks uh, that have sort of a form to an extent in terms of getting uh, important content distributed, um, but it definitely needs to go a lot farther. So thanks for, um, for mentioning that. That's, that's a good point. There are a lot of criticisms to be made, um, of alternative media as well, but it is worth noting that it, it you know, it's been a hard climate, uh, the past year and a half, not just because of the censorship. A lot of people haven't been willing to stick their necks out. Um, it, specifically last year, uh, we're seeing some, some shifts, uh, start to happen, uh, there. Hopefully they're, uh, genuine. <laughs> um, but, you know, we can only hope that, uh, more people who have seen, uh, what has been going on and have platforms are, uh, willing to engage with that, uh, information now, uh, realizing <laughs> that so much is on the line. Um, because, you know, ultimately, if there's any point when you have ever challenged, um, the official narrative of, of the state, um, in any capacity, uh, you know, you're not going to be spared, uh, the censorship hammer down the line. It's not like they're going to favor, uh, you over the Washington Post or the New York Times or something like that. And there have been, um, some quote unquote anti-imperialist, uh, outlets in both the U.S. and the U.K. that have, um, been, been quite, um, unfriendly to those that, uh, have questioned some of the prevailing orthodoxies of COVID-19 narratives. Uh, hopefully there is a change of heart there, um, or at least a willingness to address things, um, uh, that are of concern to all groups, uh, and, and sort of bypass the whole vaccine, uh, debate in its entirety, things, uh, that involve sort of this push towards, uh, the fourth industrial revolution and the automation and thus elimination of jobs, this effort to create a, what is essentially an anti-human, uh, future, uh, central bank digital currencies, all of that. None of that has to do with the concerns that, or the disagreements that arose over COVID-19. Uh, is it really as bad as they say? Is it not? Whatever. I mean, that debate at this point, um, doesn't even really have to be relevant for these people to be talking about some of the topics that are, are pressing. But unfortunately, some, uh, wish to act like it's still 2019, um, in terms of the content, uh, they're covering and, and, uh, you know, uh, they're, uh, unfriendly attitude towards uh skeptics so hopefully they, we see a change of heart uh in in that regard sooner rather than later that's my hope anyway no i hope you're right and you made a very good point there because you're right i mean we're beyond that at the moment i mean when we're looking at things like central bank digital currency and and the, the total transformation of the international financial and monetary system it, it it's that's, well what it's almost as if you know the idea of the, the debates that, that we would have about, you know, the pandemic are irrelevant, really. I and, think they and, want us still focused on that forever, <laughs> to be focused on those divisions and not talk about this other stuff. I think that's ultimately what the powers that be are hoping uh, alternative media does, um, arguing amongst themselves about things that have already happened. That sort of happened with 9-11 in the U.S. to an extent, no, right? Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, even now, I mean, you, you, people just, I think, and part of the, I also reason, part of the reason that I wrote the book, because I wanted to demonstrate in the book that this is not about a disease. You know, this isn't, this isn't about people being ill and, and, and that kind of thing. It's not about public health. That isn't the focus of the policy trajectory. The policy trajectory is, is, using and exploiting public health but public health is not the issue the issue the issue is transformation and it is transformation primarily of the international financial and monetary system but it's also transformation of us it's, it's, it's transformation of society and it's even transformation of us as a species i mean they, they no that's a great point <laughs> You know, they, they, they are, you look at 
there's some of the things, I mean, some of the things that you read, you know, that Klaus Schwab has written, for example, Klaus Schwab, it's, it's insane. I mean, you, you you would actually think that, you know, if you'd have picked this up at any other period in history, you would look at it and think, wow, that guy's, you know, he's really out there. You know, the same the same kind of things that that people might accuse. So, quote unquote, the so-called conspiracy theorists of that this is lunatic fringe stuff. Well, if you read what he has written, it is lunatic fringe. He's stuff. the lunatic fringe guy. Yeah, great point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty far out there. I mean, and, and but this is the this is the, the the part of that that we that we need to understand. His ideas are part of this global public private partnership, this network of policy creators who do not look at Klaus Schwab and think he's a lunatic fringe. These are crazy ideas. They've got a lengthy history of being very, very interested in transforming us as a society and as people. And, you know, the whole eugenics agenda and all that kind of stuff, they are absolutely steeped in it. And if you're aware of that, when you look at the policies, you can see it. You, it it's it's evident in their policies. If you if you, I always kind of think it's not like that. I mean, I think it's an overused term. But I mean, I, at the moment, I think it's important that we consider what it actually means in terms of awakening or or even. um you know, it's. I hate saying it because to me it sounds arrogant and it sounds like, oh, I'm right. Listen to me, and you know. But but I think we need to. If once you can see it, you 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 won't ever unsee it. Once you understand where these people come from, what their interests are, and what their objectives are, and why they want to shape policy. When you understand that historical context and also the modern economic and industrial and social objectives of their, of their policy ideas, once you get a grip of that, then pretty much everything we see, it just shines out of it. it you, you can, you can analyse anything, any modern government policy and see that, that where that what how that supports that agenda in any policy you can pick it up and say well right how does this policy su policy support the transformation agenda and it and they all do and they all do and we're head and that's that's where we're heading yeah i i really hope more people start to focus um on on this on the particular aspects of this transformation agenda because I, it's, it's probably clear to you um Ian, and, and considering how much time you uh, spent on it in, in your book, I, I think it is that they, they've they've really are moving away from the COVID narrative, or at least moving towards a revised COVID narrative that includes climate change and a lot of this um, SDG uh, green finance, which is digital trans uh, you know transformation of our relationship with the natural world. Uh, but this is also happening, you know, um, in, in terms of, you know, um, health services. It's definitely happening in the NHS, uh, with NHS X, this, this push to digitally transform, uh, healthcare that's also ongoing in the United States and other places as well. I mean, this is something that's happening in every facet of society. Um, you could argue that the, uh, and, and I think, uh, it, it's quite true that vaccine passports are really just a, a way to sort of usher in this digital ID. Um, that's, uh, you know, has your medical records and your central bank digital currency wallet on it and all of this stuff tied together in a, in a centralized system. It is sort of the first uh, step towards that. But, you know, in, in alternative media and, and also among a lot of people that are consumers of inter alternative media, um, we are still focused primarily on, um, stuff that has already happened. Um, or, or stuff that sort of, uh, you know, is specific only to the COVID-19, uh, situation. And I think it's really, uh, time that we start incorporating, uh, some more of this because we also have to preempt the narratives and the events before they happen, um, as well. And we're already seeing a lot of this buzz around net zero and climate change. I mean, obviously it's going to become, um, a lot more extreme, uh, over the course of November and I think December as well. Um, but we really have to start um, educating people about this stuff. 
Um, and so I think, um, you know, um, there needs to be a, a shift there in terms of content a little bit as well. And that doesn't mean like, don't, I'm not saying people should stop covering COVID-19 or anything like that, but I think we definitely need to, um, keep our eye on where the ball is moving because certainly the powers that be are, um, and we can't really afford to not see where, uh, they are taking things. And there's a lot more going on than just, um, uh, the vaccine at this point, you know? No, yeah, no, I couldn't agree anymore. I, I mean, I mean, we've already heard, haven't we, from uh, the economist uh, Mariana Mazzucati, wasn't it, that, that wrote about um, climate lockdown? Yeah, I think the Guardian wrote about it as well. There's a few yeah, other. The mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and that's that. It's the as you you used a very good term earlier, cross pollination. They're thinking in terms of systems. They're thinking into. I mean, and this is which, which gets to the point about how do we respond to it? Then we respond to it by decentralizing a non-systematic approach. But they're, they're thinking of it in terms of systems. So they're lining up their systems at the moment. And that is, that is pretty evident. So they are lining up their control systems to lead us to a point where in order for us to trans the first stage, you know, in my view, and I could well be wrong about this and I'm, I am speculating here, but in my view, will be economic collapse. But at that point, when 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 economic collapse occurs, of course, that is going to throw the world into a turmoil, unlike anything we've seen. You know, I mean, it's it's not going to make. I mean, you know, I mean, you could argue that there there is no pandemic. I mean, in my view, there's never been a pandemic, but nonetheless, obviously, it's been a very traumatic period in a lot of people's lives and you know i you know totally accept that but when the world is thrown into economic collapse which which is highly likely in my view then that will be a point where they need to have got their control systems in place yeah so that so it's a process so the first thing they've got to do is get us on to cbdc or get us get us used to the biometric controls and the tracking and the tracing and the and the social credit score, get us accustomed to that. How long will that take? Who knows? Because we, we seem to have become accustomed to this these things very, very quickly. Some people have. Some people in Chile with the uh, vaccine passport, here they call it a mobility pass, um, are, are, they are asked to present it in order to enter a restaurant, for example, and are thrilled <laughs> I've seen it on the faces of some people, very proud uh, to show their their little QR code, um, show what good citizens they are. So, yeah, it definitely has moved fast um, in, in some ways. Yeah, but I think um, uh, pursuant to your point, they need a controlled demolition of the current economic system in order to introduce and force widespread adoption of their new system, right? So I think economic collapse um, is in the cards, but it will be at a time uh, of their choosing, I think. And that will be once central bank digital currencies advance uh, slightly yeah. more. We appear to be at the white paper stage of most central bank digital currencies, how long between the white paper stage and it being ready for implementation. Uh, it remains to be seen. We know that China is piloting, has been piloting theirs um, most of this year, the digital yuan, complete with an expiration date imposed by the central bank on the yuan, so you can't decide if you save or spend. Uh, they decide that for you. Um, that's, you know, how they're starting. And Russia. And Russia. <laughs> right. And we have, uh, we know that Britcoin, the UK CBDC is in development. We know that Fedcoin is in development. New Zealand's announced theirs. Chile has announced theirs. Uh, many mm-hmm. governments are currently working on this. Um, Visa um, has talked about a framework for a uh, seamless exchange between CBDCs on the global scale. They've already set that up. It's advanced quite rapidly in the past year and a half, which is why I wish more people would talk about it because it is uh, coming quite quickly. But does that mean it'll be in two months? Uh, I don't know, but I think people need to, um, you know, pay attention to CBDCs and how they develop, because I think that'll also inform the timing of uh, the controlled demolition of the current system as well. But I think, um, you know, uh, John Titus, who came on my last episode to talk specifically about CBDCs, thought that we uh, still have a good bit of time between then and now. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I I hope he's right, and I hope you're right too. But, <laughs> the, but the problem is that is that, that is assuming that the white papers are only just been written. 
Ah, uh, shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they could have, they yeah, could have written 10 point. years ago. Yeah. You know. mm-hmm. So, so uh, I think the key is the base rate. The economic situation at the moment cannot withstand any hike in the base rate. If the base rate goes up, that is going to cause a collapse pretty quickly. So I think that's the thing to look for. If the base, and they're already talking about it, they're already saying, oh, we're going to have to, you know, inflation, we're going to, which they've caused, absolutely have they right. caused that mm-hmm. with, by printing money on, on a on a stupid scale. I mean, <laughs> yeah. the, the, I mean, the fact is that the, the fact that they've done that demonstrates that they've got absolutely no interest in maintaining the, the current international monetary and financial system. They've got no interest in it. It's a dead duck as far as they're concerned. So they knew that. They were talking about that in 2019. And they've been talking about the digital currency for a lot longer. So if they push the base rate up, I mean, at the moment, the the, the last time that the uh, the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey was talking about it, or it was actually it was Hugh Pill was talking about it, they were talking about 0.75%. Well, 0.75% would be pretty harsh for a lot of people. But, I mean, if you look at the scale of of the national debt and of the quantitative easing, if it goes up 1.5, 2, 3, if they push the base rate up that by that much, that's it. That is it. That's game over. And that is when it will happen. So they could, they appear to be poised and ready to do that. But I mean, you know, I mean, like I said, I'm speculating. I don't know. But they're, they're certainly talking about it. Right. Well, these are all things worth considering. I mean, no one really has a crystal ball to know when they're going to pull the plug, except for the people that will be doing the pulling of the plug. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, the best we can do is try and sort of anticipate their movements to an extent. But going back to my prior point, I think that's also why it's so important to preempt narratives understand what they plan to offer as the solution when these events happen and have inform as many people around you as you possibly can um, that that's going to happen, whether you have a large on- online platform or not. Any person you can talk to about it that you think will be receptive, please um, consider doing that. Um, uh, anyway, we've been going about uh, ooh, close to two hours, so um, I'll, I'll probably be wrapping it up here. Do you have any concluding thoughts uh, you'd like to add? You already told people how they can uh, find your work, though. I don't know if you mentioned how they could support you, um, if you'd like to add that in. Um, yeah, um, I, there's a there's a page on my on my website where I'll be you know more than happy to take a donation if people like to kindly offer um, a donation. That would be greatly appreciated. But um, yeah, you know, I mean, I don't. Um, nothing, nothing is paywalled. I don't. I don't. I don't sell anything. I just. I mean, obviously, if you want my book, um, um, I'll make a small profit on that. But I mean, that's. Uh, you know, I mean, you can get the book for free. You don't need to buy it. That's the point. And because I, I don't want people to have to be behind. I don't want anything that I do to be behind a paywall or anything like that. So, um, yeah. Um, but if people would like to donate, you can do so through my website and that would be greatly appreciated. Um, and I'd just like to say that the reason that I chose the name In This Together many, many years ago was because it was being bandied around at the time by the Conservative government after the financial crash. And the first and the, the, the first thing that struck you about the about the use of the term In This Together that was that we collectively are in this together. We, you know, the people who suffer from from economic hardship, which is caused by the policies of these people, we're in it together, um, but they're not. And, you know, we need to remember that, that we, that we are together and that we need to act collectively. We need to support each other. We need to be kind to each other. We need to be humane to each other. And, and that's 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 what we need to do if we're going to get through this, because it's going to be difficult and it's going to be hard. But I'd just like to thank you very much, Whitney, for having me on. It's been a pleasure. I've really appreciated it. Yeah, likewise. Um, thank you so much for your time and for a, a great conversation. Hope I, I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, listeners, regu- especially res- regular listeners of this podcast, will uh, particularly enjoy this episode. And I think it's a really important topic. So um, if you enjoyed, please consider sharing widely 
um, with people uh, you know, both on social media and and elsewhere. Um, and uh, thank you, a special thank you to everyone who supports this podcast, uh, either through Rockfin or directly through my website, um, unlimitedhangout.com. If you'd like to support the podcast through my website, you can go to unlimitedhangout.com slash join. Uh, well, thanks so much uh, for listening and uh, catch you all on the next episode.